Trevor Snell. Football. Matt Pallia. Volleyball. Liam McGuire. Basketball. Colt Lee. Hockey. Austin McKay. Baseball. Danny Wright. Tennis. Hello and welcome to the first edition of the Sports Wire for 2014. I'm Liam McGuire. On the show, a big finish at the K-Rock Center, the Blue Jays' winter tour stops at Kingston, and keeping warm at the Loyal Sports Dome. The Kingston Frontenacs rolled out the red carpet for two of their players this month. Henry Eakin and Amiko Vinanen were honored for their performances at the World Juniors. Colton Weens has a story. The 2014 World Junior Hockey Championships saw Team Finland take home gold. On that team were two Kingston Frontenax players, defenseman Mikko Vainanen and forward Henry Ekenen. After defeating Canada in the semifinals, Vainanen said it made the return to Canada even better. It honestly, it felt really good. Now, like, nobody can say anything to us and it felt really good. In Kingston, there was no hostility whatsoever when the fans welcomed the pair home. Uh, we, had a, we had a good ceremony there. We got, we got a couple of... Uh, Couple paintings there, and uh, and all the all the guys, congrats! That so it was great. Now that the two Finns have a gold medal, Frontenac goaltender Matthew Mahalik believes that it will add a lot more confidence to their game. Everyone uh, throughout every year that I've I've played in this league, you know the guys that go and play World Junior come back, and and uh, they've always all, all obviously learned a lot from their experience and and uh, they can bring a whole new element to our team and, and share their experience with us. And it's great to have them back too. We need them. We've had a short line up here for a while and, and uh, I'm sure the guys will like having a little bit more of a breather rather than rolling three lines. The Kingston Frontenacs are clearly happy to have their two Finnish players back from the World Junior Hockey Championship and hope that that gold medal will give them more confidence in their playoff run. Colton Weens, QNet Sports, Kingston. Now with the first segment of what we call the TV timeout, here are Austin McKay and Colton Weens. Well, welcome to the first TV timeout of the show. I'm Colton Weens alongside Austin McKay. And after doing a story like I did with the Finnish guys from Kingston, you know, it's, it's weird it's talking to people who don't exactly speak English that well. So that brings us to our first TV timeout topic, and that's going to be the weirdest interview you've had or toughest interview with someone who doesn't speak English very well. Yeah, I've definitely had one of those. Last year I was doing a story with the Bulls and I was waiting in the tunnel where you do the interviews and uh, I wasn't really looking for anyone particular at this moment and uh, Daniil Zharkov comes walking by and I was just like, hey, can I grab a quick interview from you? And he just kind of gives me this weird look and I'm just like, and he's like, sorry, I'm Russian. <laughs> and he goes away and I'm just like, like, are you in a rush or like you can't speak English? Are you Russian? Like, ah, I, just, I had no idea. Fun. He looks at me funny and I just stare at him and he's just, and then he walked away and I never talked to him again. He got traded. Oh, there you go. <laughs> yeah, so. I think mine, my next, next to interviewing the two Finns, but I think uh, the, the weirdest one was uh, Loyalist College Volleyball, Cam Fung Tai, their head setter. And uh, I went to interview him and he goes, well, can you ask me the questions first? Because I don't speak English very well. So it was, a, it was kind of a rough interview, but it was, it was all right. It, I got some good clips out of it, so it worked out well. Yeah, it's, <laughs> it's always tough when those uh, inter questions don't go over well. Yeah, especially in the sports world. You never know what yeah. language they're going to be speaking. But anyways, that does it for our first time out. So back to you, Liam, and we'll see you later. There's been no denying that the winter of 2014 has been brutal. But there's a place where you can escape that cold and even break out of sweat. Austin McKay dropped by the Loyal Sports Dome that offers a variety of sporting activities. The giant white bubble that's located right beside Loyalist College may look like the home of the Michelin Man, but instead of piles of tires, there are piles of balls. Sports balls, like for floorball or tennis or even golf. The Loyalist Sports Dome offers almost every need a sports goer could have. Uh, I mean, it has all its campus recreation programs and so it has ultimate frisbee and they have uh, touch football in there sometimes and they have uh, they've done cricket in here uh, 
Brody Telford uses the dome up to five times a week. Uh, there's some friends I rent out and I just pay, it's cheap, I pay five, ten bucks for an hour or two. And just play. Tori Buck has been working for the dome for four years. She said the sports dome provided her a great place to work while in school and now after. Uh, they, it's just nice because um, usually we stick to one shift a week sort of thing, so I was able to juggle having a part-time job, so having a little bit of extra cash, um, and doing basketball and schoolwork, so it was just a perfect combination. And that, instead of going into town and, you know, like, getting your way, it's so easy and convenient. You can just, you know, finish class, go to res, and come play a game or whatever. The Sports Dome is open from 7 to 11 every day of the week. Even though they work closely with Loyalist, the Dome is open for everyone. And all Greg Gavin would like would be to work even more. He'd like to push the closing time to 12 o'clock midnight. Austin McKay, QNET Sports, Belleville. Thanks Austin. Now time for the Sportswire panel. I'm Liam McGuire, joined by Danny Wright, Matt Paglia, and Trevor Snell. On today's show, we'll be talking about Masahiro Tanaka and his potential uh, coming to the MLB. Uh, we'll talk about the Toronto Raptors, and we'll talk about the Olympics. Who would you take and who would you sub off? So first, uh, Masahiro Tanaka, Japanese phenom, is potentially coming to the MLB and his asking price may be $25 million plus a season. Is this a smart move for a team looking for a frontline starting pitcher? No. <laughs> Honestly, I don't think you should take the risk. Uh, you're going to have to pay him a lot of money. He's asking for a lot, or he should get a lot, because uh, obviously right now people want... Uh, there's a need for pitching anyways, and they're really hoping that uh, he'll work out. There's always going to be teams that are just going to throw money at people who, like, good prospects. You have the Yankees, they're going to throw money at prospects. The Dodgers, uh, Magic Johnson uh, is at the helm there right now and he wants a team on the field to produce right now. And while they are producing, he wants to make sure that year after year they do. So I'm going to say pe teams are going to take that risk, but I, I wouldn't. I wouldn't take the risk. Yeah, Danny, I think you got the right answer right there. I mean, there's Japanese pitchers that always come in and more often than not, they never produce. Uh, you Darvish, I think, is the only one that is reasonably successful, albeit only two seasons. But, I mean, Tanaka, he's 23-0 in the 1.27 ERA. Great numbers. The eight complete games are a big thing, too. But I think the two teams that will pursue him hard are the Oakland Athletics, just because that team just always surprises everybody. And um, the Los Angeles Dodgers, who already said, everyone, back off, because we're going to be outspending everyone, so don't even bother. So... I definitely think teams shouldn't, but the Dodgers will ultimately most likely end up with him. Well, I'm going to say no, and here is why. The reason is risk versus consistency. I would like to put the money in the hands of somebody who has shown consistency. Um, it's, it's backfired in too many clubs before uh, give, putting money to risk, and here's three perfect examples of Japanese players that have come over and not exactly lived up to expectations. Kazuhisa Ishii. Daisuke Matsuzaka, and Kai Igawa. Those are three players that didn't pan out the way those teams expected them to, and they way overpaid for them. Yes, you could argue Daisuke Matsuzaka helped the Boston Red Sox to a World Series in 2007, but he has been terrible ever since. The panel in uh, some sort of agreement here, actually fully in agreement. Mm -hmm. uh, next, we're gonna move on to the Toronto Raptors. They are, they've won a lot of games since trading Rudy Gay. Is this something that is sustainable, or will they fall off? What do you guys think? I think it's sustainable. Um, first off, just to get this out of the way, um, th since the Rudy Gay trade, the Toronto Raptors are, have the most wins in the East. It's very impressive uh, for the fact that the Heat are also in the East. Otherwise, the East is uh, a little bit lame. Um, after dwelling in mediocrity for years, uh, I think six seasons now, the Toronto Raptors finally have a chance to bring a playoff game or a series of playoffs to Toronto. That's huge for this team. DeMar DeRozan has never been in the playoffs, and he's going to look to lead this team to the playoffs. I think they'll win the Atlantic and go to the playoffs and hopefully get to the second round at least. Yeah, I do think it is sustainable just because it is the Eastern Conference. The Raptors are only one of four teams to be above 500, and you don't get to say very often your Atlantic division leading Raptors. So... I do think it's sustainable, but I don't think that they're going to go any farther past the first round. Well, I think it depends on what your definition of sustainability is. And to me, what they're doing right now, I think they have a great thing going. 
And if their expectation is to just make the playoffs and get one round in to the, or get past the first round into the second round, I think that's a possibility. They're in third in the East. They're 12 and five since the Rudy Gay trade. They've beaten some really good teams, including Dallas, Oklahoma City, and the Indiana Pacers. I think this team's for real. I don't think they're ready to compete for a championship yet, but they might not be too far away. Now, the Canadian Olympic hockey team has named their roster, and there's been a lot of chatter about who, who should have made the team, who didn't make the team. So who's one guy that didn't make the team that you'd put on the team, and who's one guy you'd take off? Well, you can't take everybody, Liam. Uh, the depth of this, like, I, I honestly think that going into announcement day, they should uh, have that as their slogan. They should say, you can't take everybody, and so people, you know, understand this because there's been a lot of chatter about who you should take. Um, the one person that I would definitely take is Claude Giroux. Uh, he had 93 points two seasons ago, and last year about a point a game. Uh, that's playing incredible hockey. He simply started the year rough this year, um, and I guess Team Canada couldn't look past that. Yeah, I think I agree 100% with Danny here. Clojure is the guy that should be on the team. He's got 13 goals and 41 points, uh, despite the slow start. And one guy that needs to get off the team, you know, Jeff Carter, who, phenomenal player, don't get me wrong, but I just don't think he's as versatile as Clojure can be. They both can play the same positions. They can both take a draw in either end of the ice. And I do think Clojure is the better player, and Jeff Carter should have been left off the team. Well, there's a couple players that would have left off this team, and it starts with Jeff Carter, just like Matt said. I would have left Jeff Carter off this team, and I would have put Martin St. Louis in his place. We're talking about a guy that's a two-time Art Ross winner. He won the Art Ross last year, and he's only finished with below 80 points twice since 2005, 2006, and one of them was last year when he won the Art Ross in a 48-game season, and the other was in 2011, 2012, when he had 74 points in 77 games. This is an elite-level score, and I think they're going to regret not putting him on the roster. A couple other guys I would have left off are probably Patrick Marlowe and Chris Kunitz. I would have definitely liked to see Eric Stahl on this team and Claude Giroux, possibly Joe Thornton as well, but you really can't lose with whatever roster you go with. It's Canada. If they play their cards right, they could probably have three teams out there and come away with gold, silver, and bronze. Thanks. That's our time. Uh, thanks, Danny. Thanks, Matt. And thanks, Trevor. Uh, now for a quick TV timeout with Colton Weens and Austin Mackay. Hello and welcome back for the second TV timeout of the show. I'm Colton Weens alongside Austin McKay and just after the panel did that wonderful talk about the Team Canada roster, we're going to be talking what our favorite moment in Team Canada ice hockey history was. So Austin, start it off. Me, plane stands out instantly. Reshaped my whole view of hockey. Canada, USA, 2002. Canada ends their 50 year drought. Five minutes in, they're already down one nothing to the States. Pronger stops up at the blue line. He sees Korea on the far side. He goes cross ice for the pass. Everyone thinks he's going to Lemieux in the middle. It goes between his legs. Lemieux knows everyone is going to him. Goes, fakes the shot, goes to Korea. Richter bites, goes in. From then on, Canada takes the game, ends the 50 year drought. Oh, it was amazing. Wow. Definitely top moment ever. Easily an unbelievable goal, but I think the one that I got tops it, it's the golden goal. The golden boy, Sid the Kid, and in 2010 Vancouver Olympics when Sidney Crosby just threw it on net and over time Canada needed a goal to win it. And uh, yeah, they got their goal. Of course, the pass coming from my guy, Jerome McGinley, freezes Ryan Miller, Sidney Crosby does, just throws it on net and a beautiful goal. And I think all of Canada was jumping for that one. Yeah, we needed that too after that poor 2006 showing. Oh, of course. So that ends our second TV timeout. We'll be back with a third one later, but for now, back to you, Liam. Every winter, the Toronto Blue Jays tour the country to meet their fans. The Blue Jays were in Kingston earlier this month to do that, take in a hockey game, and visit the troops at CFB Kingston. Danny Wright has a story. Blue Jays' Steve Delbar, Josh Tolley, Adam Lynn, Anthony Ghost, and manager John Gibbons attended the OHL Frontenex game in Kingston. The Toronto team hits the road every winter for an assortment of community events and public appearances to give back to their fans. Well, it's good to, to get out and interact with fans who, uh, especially out here who, where Toronto is not that convenient to go to a game, so it's a chance for them and us to, to kind of see, to see each other. Some of the fans that can't get to Toronto to watch games, they get to, you know, get to meet some of the players and get to see what we're all about and, you know, kind of get spark up the, the excitement for the new season. 
good to get in the community and you know visit the, the kids and say thank you because I mean they're they're your biggest fans and you know the kids get the parents to go and get the parents into it and you know get them watching games support us and it, you know it really means a, a great deal to them. I think it's great. I think um, you know it may, obviously means a lot for the community, but for us, um, you know, as the players and the organization, it's nice to come out and uh, you know, it's nice to see the support that we have. I mean, so far away as well. The Jays swapped jerseys with the Frontenacs and then took in an entertaining hockey game that was not short of goals. Canada is so into hockey in that, that you know, at any level they play, it's going to be it's going to be great quality. The Blue Jays would toss t-shirts into the crowd and conduct a home run derby on the ice. The Toronto Blue Jays joined a packed house at the K-Rock Centre on Friday night. The Frontenacs beat the Oshawa Generals 9-4 in a thriller of a game. The Blue Jays continued their winter tour Sunday in Peterborough. Danny Wright, QNet Sports, Kingston. Now, the final installment of our TV timeouts. Welcome to the final edition of the TV timeouts. I'm Austin McKay here with Colton Weens with the Super Bowl coming up. We're just talking favorite NFL playoff moment. So many good Super Bowls over the years. What's your favorite moment? Well, my favorite moment is Giants Patriots in the Super Bowl. Eli Manning in the pocket breaking. I think it was about four tackles. Finally gets the ball off. Everyone thought he was going to go down. And he sends it down to David Tyree. He catches it on the side of his helmet. Glue. It was unbelievable. Patriots lose it there. That's when it was all over because the Giants ran down and they finished it off. What a disappointing loss. Patriots had such a good season that year. My favorite playoff moment, Steelers. They're in the Super Bowl against Carol uh, Arizona in 2008. James Harrison runs it back at halftime. Not the best moment. Arizona... Larry Fitzgerald catches the ball late in the game, gets a nice touchdown. Everyone thinks Cardinals are going to win, but no. Ben Roethlisberger does his dying moments, uh, charges up the field, throws a perfect pass to San Antonio Holmes, catches it tippy toes in the corner. They win the Super Bowl. Sixth Super Bowl, the best all time now. All time best ever. No Super Bowl can top it until the Steelers win again. Pretty good moment. All right, that's all we got here. See you next time. Thanks, guys. That's it for the first edition of the Sports Wire for 2014. Thanks for watching. I'm Liam McGuire. See you next time. Today's show, we'll be talking about Mint. Oh, sorry. Okay. Masahiro Tanaka. Masahiro Tanaka. Cold means. QNet Sports, Belleville. I'm not in Belleville. Okay. Thank Danny, Matt, and Trevor. Uh, I'm be no, that's the same. I'm saying sorry. Sorry. Okay, just hit me in the head. Just do it. Don't hit me in the chest. Nismic, Dan. Football. <laughs> yes. That's my favorite moment. That's our uh, <laughs> that's our final team. Oh my god, guys, we're really there. Was what do we do at the end though? Here now for a quick TV timeout with us. How do the intro extra again?